I have no disclosures. So just a couple of quick facts about PFOs. Um, it's estimated to occur, as we know, in about 20 to 25% of the adult population. PFOs come in several different varieties of risk. And they've been implicated in many conditions other than stroke, um, such as migraines or platypnea orthodeoxia syndrome, decompression sickness, and paradoxical embolization. So there are a lot of uh, great clinical concern, um, but really cryptogenic stroke has been the focus and the centerpiece of um, studies and discussions around PFO closure. We know based on the type of PFO, whether you have a straddling thrombus, which I personally have never seen, but that would obviously be the highest risk scenario, or the presence of a PFO with a septal aneurysm or a large shunt, uh, or a history of a preceding DVT or PE, um, those are some of the, the risk features. And of course, just a small shunt PFO without any accompanying septal aneurysm or any other uh, history of DVT would be sort of a less risky uh, uh, PFO. But the type of PFO and the risk stratification of this uh, congenital defect certainly weighs on our likelihood or propensity to close it, their rope score, and the clinical appropriateness for closure. We know that the data for PFO closure comes from these three key trials, the RESPECT trial, which looked at the Amplatzer PFO occluder, REDUCE looked at the GORE, uh, HELIX, and CARDIOFORM, and CLOSE looked at uh, multiple CE mark devices. And just to quickly review, we know that when you compare PFO closure to medical therapy, um, that you know, there was a, a favorability towards PFO closure in terms of ischemic stroke, but no impact on all-cause mortality. And of course, you do tend to get more AFib with PFO closure devices than you do with medical therapy. So PFO classifications, types 1, 2, and 3, based on the Siever classification published in 2014, um, and the length of the tunnel, uh, whether it's a type 1 versus, say, an, an extreme, a type 3, will impact whether some of these novel therapies that I'm about to introduce to you would be appropriate for the type of PFO that you're looking at. So understanding the PFO anatomy up front is going to be even more key as we start to see more of these devices hit the market in the future. So what are the device design considerations? I mean, all those of us who close PFOs, what are we looking for in a novel device or from our current commercial devices for that matter? We're looking for stability. We want to minimize the risk of erosion. We want to minimize our footprint, particularly on the left atrial side, thereby minimizing the risk for thrombus formation. We obviously do not want embolization of the device. We want to minimize arrhythmias, which sort of goes in keeping with the aforementioned criteria. And we want to somehow maintain the possibility for future access to the left atrium. We're doing so many more left atrial procedures nowadays. Closing a PFO should not close off the options for future transeptal access. Uh, ideally, and we want something that's easy to implant. We don't want to sit there, you know, readjusting the device for an hour. So ease, stability, minimizing footprint, those are sort of the key design considerations. So looking at some of the devices coming down the pipeline and what we currently have, in terms of self-expanding double disc occluders, our current commercial devices, as you all know, are the Amplatzer occluder and the Gore Cardioform. For interest of time, I won't go into this, but these are the two devices available on the shelf at most institutions, and this is what we use. There is a size limitation currently with the gore, cardio, with the, uh, gore cardioform. It does not come any larger than 30 millimeters, so it can close a hole up to about 17 millimeter measurement. But uh, the Amplaster device just does come in uh, in larger sizes. Regarding other types of double disc devices that are currently novel and not approved, uh, we have the Ocotec Flex 2 PFO closure device. It's actually two self-expanding nitinol discs with PET fabric patch and a hinged mechanism on the connection to the device that is actually flexible and allows you to be more coaxial with the septum. There is actually no hub on this device on the left atrial side, and it has an atraumatic tip. It comes in a variety of different sizes and can be delivered through a 9 or 11 French sheath. Uh, but th this bend point or hinge point on the delivery system can bend uh, more to more than a 45 degree angle, which uh, you know can certainly be um, helpful in some of the more challenging anatomies. We have the Starflex Cardio Seal device by NMT Medical. This is two polyester squares oriented at 45 degrees with nitinol springs, a 10 French delivery system, comes in four different sizes. Uh, there was a prospective trial of 660 patients that reported in 2012 uh, showing significantly higher long-term recurrent stroke rates with the Starflex compared to the Amplatzer or the Gore Helix. 
LifeTech occluder, the Seraflex device, which is currently has CE mark, is made of nitinol only. It's covered with a nanostructural laminated titanium nitride uh, compound. And actually, this is thought to be uh, less likely to corrode, less release of nickel, so potentially ideal for those with nickel allergies, and faster endothelialization based on um, you know, animal studies. Um, and flexible connection with the delivery cable as well, as we saw in one of the previous devices, to again help with getting coaxial with the septum. And again, no left atrial hub, so ideally less thrombogenic on the LA side. The NIT Occlude device, NIT Occlude PFO by PFM Medical is actually interesting. It's a complete device made from a single nitinol wire, and the discs are a single layer on each side, less than 50, about 50% less nitinol uh, with this design. Again, designed to reduce thromboembolic risk. Uh, it's a polyester Dacron patches that are not covered by nitinol, so to help promote faster endothelialization. And as far as PFO, uh, novel PFO occluders that address the tunnel itself, uh, this is a, a different category of novel devices. And they are directly inserted into the PFO tunnel. In other words, you need to have a tunnel, so ideally more of a type 1 PFO, with an LA and RA anchor for stability of the device. A minimal exposed footprint, as you'll see in a moment. And they pose the septum primum and septum secundum ridges together to allow for future, uh, future septal punctures. Uh, so really minimal footprint. So the Coherix flat stent is an example of such a tunnel device. It has this nitinol lat lattice framework um, with polyurethane foam that facilitates endothelialization on the right atrial side. And it comes in two different sizes. Currently, it stretches the tunnel and really opposes the, the septum primum and secundum. And again, a really minimal uh, anatomic footprint. You see how it looks on the LA versus the RA side. In terms of suture-based PFO occluders, the most well-known one that's been studied is the Noble Stitch suture device. This is um, a 4 proline suture, essentially two dedicated delivery catheters um, with a third catheter that secures the knot. You size the PFO with a balloon to determine um, you know, how you're going to position these two sutures through each of the uh, septum primum and secundum respectively. And this does require uh, the use of a fair amount of contrast dye during the procedure, as well as TE or ICE guidance. So this is a, you know, re requires the use of contrast, which is different from some of the other devices I've showed you. Some of the early results from this Noble Stitch Italian registry study, 12 Italian sites, this was reported um, last year in your, your intervention. 200 patients, 192 of them were found to be suitable for this Noble Stitch device. They achieved 96% success rate at implantation median fluoro time of 16 minutes and 200 mLs of contrast. And at 206 days of follow-up, give or take 130 days, they had less than or equal to grade one right to left shunting in 89% of patients, and there were no device-related complications. These are uh, schematics from that Euro Intervention 2018 publication showing uh, the balloon sizing and then the deployment of the two proline sutures from the septum primum and secundum, and then the third step of knotting them together to oppose the two septa. Bioresorbable occluders are really sort of a struggling area of novel PFO therapies. And you'll see why here in a moment. Uh, but basically, the Biostar closure device, which is similar to the CardioSeal, it's a tissue-engineered porcine intestinal collagen matrix. It is heparin-coated, bioresorbable, leave-behind StarFlex framework, and a higher rate of incomplete closure, and it's no longer used in routine practice. So in terms of bioresorbable novel PFO therapies, I think the, the marketplace is still struggling to find a solution for trying to reach a balance point between successful closure and uh, minimal uh, future thrombotic risk. So in conclusion, novel PFO therapies should continue to focus on what we outlined at the beginning, minimizing the atrial footprint, particularly on the left atrial side, promoting faster endothelialization, ease of deployment, being recapturable if need be, and coming in multiple sizes, um, leaving open options for future transeptal access, and trying to minimize uh, all of the above to therefore minimize uh, the risk for future atrial arrhythmias. Thank you.